Yael, this is not an interview that you ever wanted to do. Why have you decided to speak? It's been a really long road to get here. There's been some really dark nights of the soul, I have to say. I was going to be working alongside one of our national treasures. What was it like working with Geoffrey Rush? I immediately put myself at the bottom of the ladder. I didn't advocate for myself. I was just there to serve him. I was always treading that line of trying to protect myself, not quite knowing how, and never, never wanting to offend him. Whenever women speak up about issues like this, their career generally suffers. If that happens, I think it's worth it. For instance, for breakfast, he had eggs. Don't ask me how I know that, I just know. You might recognise Australian actress Yael Stone from her work in the Netflix series Orange is the New Black. You were like Dorothy. In 2010, when she was 25, Stone got the kind of break young performers dream of, starring alongside Geoffrey Rush in a play called Diary of a Madman. That same year, Rush was nominated for an Oscar for his role in The King's Speech. Tonight, Yael Stone says in her experience, his behaviour in the workplace was sometimes far from acceptable. Yael, this is not an interview that you ever wanted to do. Speaking publicly is not a decision that you've taken lightly. Why have you decided to speak? I would say that decision-making process started about a year ago. And there's been some really dark nights of the soul, I have to say. Um, on one hand, I have a very strong instinct to protect my family. Um, I have some strong issues of, of guilt and shame around this, uh, this particular issue. On the other hand, I think it's become clear that it's in the public interest that I talk about these matters. I think anecdotally we can look and see whenever women particularly speak up about issues like this, their career generally suffers. Um, I've factored that into my calculations and if that happens, I think it's worth it. You know, I have a, a very young baby girl and I want to say to her one day, you know, it was hard but I did it anyway. Tell me about being cast in Diary of a Madman alongside Geoffrey Rush. How old were you? What was the status of your career at the time and so forth? Uh, it was 2010. I was 25. I had done some shows in the theatre. I started working when I was 13, but I was by no means any particular name. Um, very excited by my work, very enthusiastic, big hopes, big dreams. Um, and when I got the call about Diary of a Mad Men, I probably can't even use the right words for how excited I was. Uh, it was that needle in a haystack kind of show where you're working with an incredible creative team, a wildly exciting script, uh, and I was going to be working alongside one of our national treasures. Um, Jeffrey Rush was very well known to me. I'd seen him on stage in Exit the King years before, also directed by Neil Armfield. It was one of the most special days of my life seeing Exit the King. I, I remember as I was leaving the theatre, I found a little um, brooch on the ground, a little brass brooch in the shape of a, a king crown. And I still have it to this day. I thought it was some kind of bizarre blessing. I thought, wow, you know, this, will, this, is, this is gonna change my life forever, seeing this kind of work, this level of talent. So the respect that I had for Jeffrey's work was um, difficult to quantify. Um, when I got the job, they asked me if I would shave my head. I had very long hair and, um, you know, it was not something that I wanted to do necessarily, but for this job, I was prepared to do anything. So I, I shaved my head to the skin. They'd actually done the show before, Neil and Jeffrey. Um, I was the, the new cast member alongside two other musicians who were also learning the show. So it was an intense, exciting process. It also meant that I would be going to New York, working overseas for the first time. All of these factors were so out of this world for me. Um, I, I, I couldn't have been more excited. What was it like working with Geoffrey Rush? Um, Geoffrey is an incredibly skilled 
actor. And uh, from the moment we started rehearsals, that was very, very obvious. And he was obviously incredibly invested in this show, which, you know, for all intents and purposes was was his show and I would be supporting him in that. Um, that was very much the dynamic of the room that we were we were working around Jeffrey's performance um, and I felt that that was that was reasonable given his stature uh, given the type of performance this this was going to be. Um, I guess I would say that I immediately put myself uh, at the bottom you know at the bottom of the ladder and that seemed right also very inexperienced um he was this person who is a internationally lauded star he's pretty much won every award you can win um i was just there to serve him and i think i probably took that too far and too literally um what do you mean i i didn't advocate for myself um in terms of behaviour that was probably reasonably inappropriate at times and I didn't know how to negotiate those boundaries because I immediately put myself in a position of servitude and something like a, a jester figure for him. Um, there was no point where I thought to myself, you know what, this is where this is where I draw the line. Um, and and you know when I talk about regret and shame that's one of those those issues you know as a as a 25 year old person I didn't have the skills that I have now to say you know what this is this is where I'm comfortable this is now uncomfortable for me um so so those issues came up again and again and again um and I and I never dealt with them and so they got worse what was the kind of behavior that began to make you uncomfortable he would text me very regularly during even that, those first two weeks of rehearsals. Um, he started with a very rigorous intellectual kind of communication that was very playful. Um, the sort of in, in, internal jokes between us uh, that, that were around the script certainly escalated and they became more and more frequent. They would go late into the night, you know, 2 a.m. Um, and what would happen is that they became increasingly sexual in nature. Um, so that that sexual energy was couched in this intensely sort of intellectually flirtatious facade. Um, so you almost didn't notice what was happening. And, and as I said, I was very willing to accommodate all of this kind of behaviour. So I was enthusiastically trying to keep up with the banter. I mean, I was certainly looking up words in the dictionary and, and trying to understand what was what was coming at me and, and try and keep up. Um, so the texts were extensive and what began as uh, playful and, and I believe were sent in, in the spirit of, of playfulness. Um, ultimately made me uncomfortable. I didn't know how to stop the text, even to the point of not replying. I didn't know how to not reply to somebody who was so much my senior, uh, who has so much power in the industry. The thought of not replying to a text message and then coming into work the next day, feeling that I'd let him down, that I had disappointed him, it was just n not an option for me. When you say the messages shifted from playful to sexual, can you give an example of the type of content? At that time, Jeffrey had discovered the word tumescence uh, and he would often refer to his own tumescence. What does that mean? Uh, one of those words I had to look up, um, it refers to an erection, to an arousal. Uh, so. And I think that's a good example of how the the intellectual nature of the way that he would communicate with me was a sort of barrier to seeing what 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 is actually going on. Somebody talking about their erection. Um, he was extremely complimentary of my work, and it sort of would escalate into a, an almost um, ecstatic fervor, which you know I. 
I felt really overwhelmed by this uh, incredibly talented person telling me how wonderful I was. And, and along with that came this barrage of, um, of things that made me feel pretty uncomfortable. But I didn't know how to, how to negotiate between uh, a professional comment and comments that were, had no place at all in a professional circumstance. Did the texting kind of behaviour bleed into the workplace in practical behaviour? Yeah, it did. It did. Um, once we started in production, I felt that I didn't have a lot of personal physical boundaries in, in the, in the theatre to feel space, to feel like I could be safe. Um, so, for example, after the show, I would often shower because I was um, covered in a lot of fake blood and makeup and sweat and tears and all the things that we get in the theatre. And after a show, Jeffrey was showering next to me in the cubicle next to me. And in one of these kind of moments where I was just breathing and, and kind of getting back to myself, I looked up and, and saw a small shaving mirror being held over the top of the cubicle. Um, so to be kind of used in a way to, to look down at, at my naked body, which I, you know, I believe it was meant in the spirit of a joke. The fact is it made me incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, I think I dealt with it by saying words to the effect of, bugger off, Jeffrey. Um, I was always treading that line of trying to, trying to protect myself not quite knowing how, and never, never wanting to offend him. That was at the top of the list. Don't offend Jeffrey, because it will affect the next performance, and ultimately, it will affect your career. After you told Mr Rush to bugger off, what did he then do? I believe he discontinued the behaviour with the mirror. Uh, we both completed our showers and continued on. Was there other behaviour that would have fallen into the category of jokey but nonetheless offensive? Uh, yes, certainly. There was uh, an experience again after one of the shows, after Jeffrey had showered, I was in our backstage area which is a shared dressing room space um, and I was sitting at the mirrors and he came in from the shower holding his towel and he was naked and he danced around in front of me with his penis out. Uh, I was sitting and he was standing so his penis was right at the, the level of my face and probably, you know, around 40 to 45 centimetres from my face. Um, and, and that, again, made me feel very uncomfortable. Uh, I didn't know what my what the re reaction I was supposed to, to give. Um, again, it was one of those moments where my response was something to the effect of, you know, an eye roll. Uh, oh goodness, you know, you're, you're, you just can't help yourself. You're so naughty, you know, like, uh, it, was, it, was, it was always a gentle admonishment, you know. It was never definitive. It was never no, stop. This is wrong. What do you fear would have happened if you'd been more than gently admonishing? I think when I reflect upon the, the professional setup of this whole situation, there really is no avenue for me at that time. This is a, a man who, as I said, internationally lauded. Um, I'd worked at that, that theatre a number of times before this show. I've never had people around the block several times over waiting for a ticket. I mean, that show was sold out a long time in advance. If I had gone to somebody and said, he needs to be pulled into line, He's not, he's, he needs to lose his job. Uh, there's, just, there's just no recourse that, that is gonna work for the theatre. Are they gonna cancel the show? Are they gonna refund all those tickets? Are they gonna boot him and keep me? No one's there to see me. Um, what happens to the New York season? I'm not gonna be the person, this young, totally unknown person that, you know, puts the spanner in the works. 
I'm not going to be that person for a number of reasons. I don't want to be difficult. I don't want to be talked about as someone that is difficult to work with. I don't want to destroy my career. You said that you didn't forcefully at any time tell Mr Rush to stop. Was there anything in your manner uh, or demeanour that could have led him to suspect that you were offended? There was one evening when we went out after a show, which is a very traditional kind of thing to do as a group of actors after a show to kind of debrief and, and come down from the, the excitement. Um, I was uncomfortable about going out on those evenings after shows. I, I told my boyfriend at the time I was uncomfortable about it. I worried there was more uh, that was expected of me than I could give. Um, on one of those evenings, Jeffrey, in a very intimate, very physically intimate way, invited me to, to come home to his accommodation with him. There was no mistaking what that invitation meant. Um, and I declined that invitation. And again, I did so in a way that made clear I didn't want to sleep with him, but also was gentle enough that I could go to work the next day and not worry about being completely iced out. I'd say that's an example of, of a way that I was trying to tread this difficult path of managing and supporting a particular kind of ego and not having to physically compromise myself. In the years that have gone by, I have really had a lot of those soul searching moments on how to deal with this stuff. Um, when the articles that, that came out around a year ago about the STC production came out, I, I actually reached out to, to Jeffrey privately and wrote a letter that basically said, I've struggled a lot with the relationship that we've had. I really see him as a, I saw him as a friend um, and a really respected colleague and we'd become close over the years. He's an incredibly fun, charming man. And we'd spent time together. Um, I wrote that I had never addressed the uncomfortable parts of our relationship because they were just so hard to deal with. So I put them away in a box in that too hard basket and I just didn't address it. And the time had come for me to say to him in, in very clear terms, things happened that made me uncomfortable. I wrote in the conclusion of that email that this was written in the spirit of healing and that I'd hope we could come together privately and work through it. Unfortunately, I didn't receive any response. You mentioned earlier that you'd said to a boyfriend at the time that things were making you uncomfortable. Was there anybody else to whom you confided about what was going on? Yeah, I spoke to my sister. I spoke to at least two friends. I spoke to that boyfriend at the time. Uh, I also kept a pretty, or, or I have kept in my life a reasonably detailed journal, um, which really covered all manner of topics, like uh, from, from things that just caught my fancy, idea, creative ideas for stories, um, experiences that I'd had, and all the way through to recording text messages that I received, you know, be they funny or confusing or upsetting or exciting. Uh, and I did record some of Jeffrey's text messages to me, uh, some of the very early ones, because I was so excited to be working with this, this person, who I actually describe in the diary as a hero. Um, as the entries go on, I, I go into what the experience was like for me. And it's hard to read back because I can see just how conflicted I am. Um, I talk about feeling 
as though I'm between a rock and a hard place. I don't know how to deal with feeling compromised, but also completely in awe of someone who has so much power. Towards the end of the season, I write some pretty sad things about how I've never hated acting so much. And that's something I've, you know, done since I was 13 and it was a great joy in my life. And I just couldn't wait for the show to be over because I did not know how to negotiate this enormous personality that had become a really defining part of my life. I, I, I wrote also to my, to my brother and sister and, and said, at the time when I was in New York, at the, the second half of, of the show, I said, I'm just at the whim of his moods and he's, I think I used the word, words quite presumptuous with me. The advice I received was words to the effect of, Jeffrey's a very powerful person. Try and make this work. Just to clarify um, one thing before, you said that when you went out to drinks, he uh, issued an invitation to you and you used the words, it was something like um, physically, it wasn't intimidating, I can't remember the exact words. Intimate, physically think, physically yes, intimate, yeah. yeah. Do you mean physically or do you mean verbally he used physically intimate language? Oh, okay, I understand what you mean. So the invitation was... Uh, it, it was an invitation to physical intimacies and it was done so in a physically intimate manner. Um, his mouth was very, very close to my ear. I could feel uh, his lips up against my body. What did you... Do you recall what you said? To, you mentioned that you tried to diffuse it as gently as you could. I, I don't recall the exact language, but I used words to the effect of... No, thank you. I, I don't think I'd like to come home with you. To be fair to Mr Rush, because he is not here, um, do you think that your participation in the text messages with him and the fact that you didn't complain strongly at the time may have led him to believe that not only did you not have a problem with his behaviour, that you actually welcomed it? I think that there is great complexities in these issues. Uh, I think that that talking in this way about the complexities of these issues is really critical for us to all move forward collectively, culturally, to make a, a healthier world around this kind of stuff. So yes, I can say that that would have been very confusing for him. I would add that consent is very complicated and almost impossible in a dynamic where the power is so drastically imbalanced. And I would say in any working environment where there is that imbalance of power, the subordinate doesn't have a great opportunity for expressing themselves freely. So the onus really is on the more powerful person not to put the subordinate in that position. Um, I totally understand that that may have been confusing for Jeffrey. I think it's a cultural issue. I think our industry, like many other industries, has supported the more powerful person, certainly supports an, an ego um, and a, a level of success like that to have everything that they want. Um, so it's a reasonable assumption for somebody like that in that position of power um, to assume that it, it's a reciprocal relationship. Um, I, I can certainly own the fact that I communicated in ways that I certainly wouldn't now. I was 25, he was 59. I would never have that kind of relationship now. I would never text back in the way that I did then. I wouldn't even use the terms that I did then. I'm not proud of that at all. Um, but I do believe that we need to shift up the cultural assumption that that's okay, um, that putting younger, more vulnerable people who are trying to get ahead in a position that is very compromising, I need, we need to shift that up and, and just look at our behaviour and maybe have some, some systematic changes to protect us from making those kinds of mistakes and wading into areas that leave people 
confused. I'll come to some of those potential structural changes um, in a second. I just wanted to ask you about one uh, last issue to do with Mr Rush's behaviour. After the play closed, you and Mr Rush were both at an awards night. What happened there? Uh, So Geoffrey, Neil, Neil Armfield and I were nominated for an award uh, separately and uh, we were backstage in the green room, Jeffrey and I, I'm not sure where Neil was at the time, and I was wearing a dress that I had borrowed from my sister and it had a completely open back and Jeffrey stroked my back in a very sensual manner um, for an extended period that, again, made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, It was in a room with other people it was a room of, of our peers. Um, I have no idea if anyone saw what happened. Uh, the following day, I believe it was, Jeffrey wrote to me and acknowledged that he had touched me in this way that was very sensual. Uh, he said words to the effect of, I couldn't help it, I, as though he was compelled to. Did he apologise? No. I don't think so. The, qu- the quote that I've got is, sorry, I also played with your back. Okay. So I believe he apologised um, and explained it by saying that, that he had felt compelled to. I believe in the same email he used words to the effect of, I loved looking down the row and, and being able to see you there. Do you have any sympathy for Mr Rush and where he finds himself? Absolutely. Um, I, I hope that, that you can see in the way that I'm talking that I, I, I think that the, the world that we come from, the culture that we come from, shapes our behaviour. So if you're constantly being told that certain behaviour is okay and no one ever stops it, there are no checks and balances on it, then it's right to assume that you can continue with that behaviour. So I have great sympathy for the fact that uh, certain behaviour has been allowed, if not encouraged along the way, and suddenly a lot of people have stood up and said no, actually no. Now I think that's a really important step to stand up and say no, but I think we we would do well to have sympathy for what that uh, huge gear shift feels like on the other side. I would like to see a world where we can work together to mend that huge rift. Um, I think that we can work interpersonally and I think we can also work at a systematic level. How do you think that would work in practice? Give me an example, say, if a production like Diary of a Madman were happening today, we have a very, very powerful established actor and a young uh, actress or actor getting a break. Mm -hmm. What could be done to to help that situation? I think irrespective of any power dynamic, um, when you enter into a theatre, traditionally you get a safety induction. Um, I think part of that induction into a workplace needs to be look, it's not appropriate to do this, this and this. We don't condone these kinds of behaviours. We would discourage these kinds of relationships. Um, If somebody had an issue where they felt uncomfortable, where they weren't sure if something was in the bounds of normal workplace behaviour, this is the person you should go to. And assurances that those conversations can be private. A supporter of Mr Rush might say, well, this was a transactional relationship. You know, sure, he was pushing the boundaries and and enjoying a flirtatious relationship with a beautiful young woman, but in exchange, you were getting the benefits of his knowledge and fame and talent and status. Well, I would certainly say that, first and foremost, I would have absolutely characterised the way that we knew each other as a friendship. and, and certainly in a friendship there were exchanges of, of knowledge, um, of experience. Uh, I certainly saw Jeffrey as somebody who was uh, inspiring as, uh, as a career and as a, as a talent. Um, I 
as I've said, you know, I would never behave in the same way that, that I did then. You know, at 25 and starting out, I absolutely l looked to somebody like that to kind of support me and, 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 and shepherd me through, through my career almost as a, a mentor or a guide. Um, the issue is that relationship was compromised from the beginning by this sexual dynamic. So I don't see any problem with a kind of mentor-mentee relationship at all. Um, I just know that it is compromised utterly by a sexual dynamic at its core. A supporter of Mr Rush might question whether the timing of you speaking to 7.30 is aimed to influence the outcome of defamation proceedings that he's launched in Sydney in a different matter. Are you? That's absolutely not the intention. I'm here to talk about my experiences and mine alone. I have no intention on commenting on anybody else's experiences. I'm, I'm here to share my truthful experience. The witness in the other matter is a woman named Erin Jean Norval. Do you have a relationship with her? I do know EJ. Um, I saw her in Melbourne in a show a number of years ago. Um, she was playing Ophelia. I thought she was incredibly talented. Um, we've had one dinner together and uh, that was probably about two years ago. Um, we communicate at times. Uh, I wouldn't consider her a close friend, no. To what extent is your decision to speak now influenced by your relationship with EJ Norville? It's not influenced by Erin Jean in any way. Um, I think you can look to, to two specific actions that I've taken in the last year. Um, I decided to write the email to Geoffrey to share my truth, something that goes back eight years, almost nine. Um, and that was a, a long process to get there. Um, and that's a very personal decision. I also spoke to Neil Armfield on the phone and I shared my experience with him. Again, this is a very personal matter, my own experience, and again, dates back almost nine years. And it's taken me a long time to get here, to get to this point where I'm speaking to you, Lee, and I'm grateful for the opportunity, but it is very, very difficult and a deeply considered decision and one that I have to make for myself. You said that you feel a sense of shame that you didn't speak up more forcefully at the time. How has that feeling affected you carrying that over time? It's been very difficult. I, I do feel that I could have had a, a positive influence on Jeffrey. I believe that I let myself down and there's a great deal of regret about that. I had enough awareness to, to write in my own words, in my own private diary that I felt uncomfortable, but I just didn't have the language to bring that into my real life. And, um, and while I have sympathy for my younger self and understand that I was in a difficult and compromising position, wanting to get ahead in my career and manage an amazing, impressive personality, personal dignity is still important and drawing those boundaries are still really important and you know if I could talk to my younger self I would say your work is enough you're in that room because your work is good managing somebody else's experience and serving them is not your job being a supportive and even enjoyable person to be around in a rehearsal process and throughout a show absolutely being a court jester for somebody else is not necessary and it's not appropriate. Yeah, Stone, thank you very much. Thank you. That interview was recorded in New York last week and we asked Geoffrey Rush to respond to the allegations made in it. Through his lawyers, he declined an interview with 7.30 but provided this statement. 
From the outset, I must make it clear that the allegations of inappropriate behaviour made by Yael Stone are incorrect and in some instances have been taken completely out of context. However, clearly Yael has been upset on occasion by the spirited enthusiasm I generally bring to my work. I sincerely and deeply regret if I have caused her any distress. This most certainly has never been my intention. When we performed in The Diary of a Madman eight years ago, I believe we engaged in a journey as artistic comrades. Over the years, we've shared correspondence that always contained a mutual respect and admiration. As I've said in the past, I abhor any behaviour that might be considered as harassment or intimidation to anyone, whether in the workplace or any other environment. We also approached theatre director Neil Armfield for comment. He's not replied to our communication. 